The Raptors start strong and finish strong as they take down the Charlotte Hornets 125-113. I'm Randy Urban, and this is Raptors Nightcap. Tonight, we're joined by Sherman Hamilton, Paul Jones, and the coach, Jack Armstrong. Jack, I'll start with you. There was definitely enough energy to start this game tonight, and it was really impressive considering who the Raptors were without, Scotty Barnes and Fred Van Vliet. Oh, you're totally right. You know, it's interesting. Uh, you, you look at the two games. It's almost like about a week ago, you say to yourself, you know what, they're going to beat the Detroit Pistons, and they're going to have a tough time with the Milwaukee Bucks. And kind of like the same thing you say, you know what, they're going to be able to beat the Portland Trailblazers last game of a West Coast trip. And, you know, first game home and they'll beat them easy. And Charlotte's going to be a tough game because Charlotte's a really good team uh, above them in the standings of the East. That's going to be a tough one to win. And as we saw with Detroit, Milwaukee, and now we see with Portland and Charlotte, uh, don't try to make a living being a prognosticator because it's too easy, too difficult to, to do it. And uh, just a few things jump out of me. I, I think, number one, Randy, what you said, their energy off the bat was really, really good. I think when you don't have a Scotty Barnes, a Ken Birch, or Fred Van Vliet, uh, you feel like, man, oh, man, we're up against it. We got to come out with force. I thought they did that. Gary Trent showed us another gear that he has. I thought the ball moved, moved beautifully. And then the last thing I would say is Pascal Siakam. Uh, is playing the best basketball he's played in his career. Mm -hmm. And think about it. He was in the all-star game. He was all league. And I think he's better than that right now. Uh, this is, this is truly elite. I mean, when you don't have a traditional point guard start the game and you see what Siakam's doing right now, uh, it's super impressive. This was a mm -hmm. wonderful win. Mm -hmm. uh, Jonesy, you know, it looked, Pascal looked going, you know, jumping on the Pascal stuff. He looked really comfortable as a primary facilitator. How did that impact the offense overall tonight? I, I just thought he did a good job of, of you know, he, he draws double teams. He knows uh, he's at the top of the scouting report. And, uh, you know, he made the simple play tonight. And he was mm -hmm. aggressive. You know, the other part of it, too, was he was making the simple play, but he was aggressive. He was he was looking to get into the lane. Um, you know, he was taking advantage of one-on-one -on -one matchups. When he got into the lane, uh, if, there, if the double wasn't coming or he, or he was playing downhill, he'd spin and finish. So I, I just think Pascal has, has um, you know, he, he stripped his game down, he simplified it, and he's playing really, really sound basketball right now, Randy. He, he, you know, making the easy pass, not trying to make the home run play. The one thing I want to see him clean up, he's getting a lot of passes deflected when they come at him on double teams. He's got to be a little bit more careful with that. But, but no question, he's, he's, uh, he's aggressive. He's seeing the floor. He's making plays for other people. And he's finding his scoring when it comes to him as well. Mm -hmm. Sherm, thoughts on Pascal or something else that jumped out at you uh, in this game? Uh, you know, I thought Pascal did a good job of... Uh mixing up how he was attacking. I mean, yeah. you know, sometimes he was attacking specifically to move the basketball, to get that second or third defender. And other times he was attacking to score. And if he had to call an audible in the middle of that to find a teammate, he did that. I just thought his pacing, his, his feel appeal for the game. Remember, Nick Nurse said to him, run the team. Basically be the point guard, be the primary playmaker and be the decision maker. And I thought he did a great job of that. Mm -hmm. And then you add to the fact that he scored efficiently. Then you add to the fact that he boarded well. He got on the glass and did a great job. I mean, his effort and energy has been phenomenal. And in a game where you don't have a leader like Fred Van Vliet, you need someone to be a leader. And I thought mm -hmm. Pascal took that and accepted that responsibility beautifully. Hey, Jack, things, things got pretty heated there in that first quarter between uh, P.J. Washington and, and Justin Champagny. Uh, when I think back about that play, I'm a little concerned or surprised that the refs kind of let that get it get to that point, right? Because there were some things brewing there prior to that. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And uh, it, it, it did reach that point where you go, you know, this could have been nipped in the bud and it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, nonetheless, uh, from a Raptor perspective, 
in my opinion, it kind of all worked out beautifully because uh, it played itself out in a way that uh, your team was inspired. Uh, Charlotte uh, was put in a tough position. And to me, I'm okay with how it worked out. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and you know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, the referees have a tough job too. And, uh, you know, sometimes what we might see as brewing, uh, they, you know, when they're right on the floor with the guys and based upon the chatter that's going on, they might think it's just good natured uh, guys yeah. ripping each other a little bit. And, and then a spark just takes place and it goes from uh, something that you don't think is really inflammatory to something that really gets uh, pretty heated quick. Mm -hmm. uh, and that happens sometimes, but nonetheless, I think from a Toronto perspective, everything worked out beautifully. Yeah. Um, Jonesy Malachi Flynn got some run because of all these, you know, guys out and, and Banton with some foul trouble. I thought he looked way more comfortable today. Uh, just assess his play from your perspective. I, I think he's, I really think he's becoming a good young professional. Mm -hmm. It seems like he's been around forever. It's only a second year. And, and, um, you know, I saw it at the beginning of the year. There was a game where he didn't play and, the, and, and he came out right back out on the court 15 minutes after the locker rooms were closed and we were finishing our nightcap from uh, the maple, uh, from the, you know, the up in the uh, restaurant. I remember that. Yeah. And, and we were walking out and he was out there getting the shots up. And that says to me, Hey man, I'm going to be ready when my number is called. Uh, I, the other thing, part of it too, is the development, Randall. He's sitting on the bench and he's watching Pascal. He's watching Fred. He's, he's in the video sessions. He's learning stuff. He got a little bit of run last year when it was, you know, pure development time. He's mm -hmm. not getting as much this year at times, but I think he's staying ready. And, you know, he's, uh, he's, he was aggressive with the ball tonight. He made some good plays. He knocked down some shots. Uh, you can tell he's been working on stuff. He made one move uh, where he drove. He went behind the back into a jump stop and knocked down about a, an 18, 20 footer. Those are things that show me, hey, I'm ready. When I get mm -hmm. my chance, I'm, I'm going to make good with it. So I, I think he's becoming a good young professional. Mm -hmm. you know, can I just say one thing? I, I think the thing that is good is the fact that he's got to earn it. You know, yeah. the fact that uh, at their starting Pascal Siakam tonight is the point guard, right? And, uh, you know, and, and you look at a guy like Fred Van Vliet playing so well. And Scotty Barnes has proven himself to be a very good facilitator. Uh, once again, I made this point. We've had all three of us, all four of us have had this discussion before. When you break in a winning organization, you know, if I put uh, Malachi Flynn in Sacramento, or one of those places that are the doldrums of the NBA, uh, he probably gets handed 20, 25 minutes a night. And maybe he thinks he's better than he is. Uh, maybe his stats become inflated, yet he's not winning. Mm -hmm. I think in Toronto, uh, you know, tonight he came, on with his, came in with his hard hat on and his uh, work boots on and his uh, lunch, lunch bucket. And he knew, man, hey, I got a short window here. I better mm -hmm. perform at a high level. Mm -hmm. And I think that brings the best out of you. And I think if you ask Fred Van Vliet and Pascal and OG and guys like that, that they broke into winning, uh, they had to prove themselves and they weren't getting handed nothing. And yeah. I think in the long run, in, in spite of the fact that people get frustrated with the fact that Malachi Flynn was a first round pick and he's not playing, I think in the long run, it's going to make him a better professional player. And mm -hmm. to me, that's more important. Mm -hmm. Sure. And let's talk a little bit about Gary Trent Jr. Because, you know, he, he had that ankle injury. He comes back, doesn't shoot a great 412 and 415 tonight on fire. Um, five triples, 32 points. And when I watch the team play with him playing that way, it's so obvious that he is so critical to what this team uh, can do in the future. Yeah. Well, I agree with that, but you can't underestimate, you know, you never want to have your key guys out of the roster. You want everybody healthy. But in a situation like this, I thought going into this game that this was going to be a great opportunity for Gary Trent Jr. to move up the, the ranks a bit in terms of offensive responsibility. And he does that. I mean, right after Pascal, you know, you have OG, you have Gary Trent there. 
and both of them had great games, but mm -hmm. specifically for Gary Trent Jr., because he gets his offense in a different way, because defensively he can impact the game, you want him on the floor. And I thought in this game he did a great job when Charlotte came out in that third quarter and went on that run. Gary Trent Jr. made some buckets to kind of hold him at bay when they got close. And that's the kind of play you need from a guy who understands what he can do and, and a guy who can be a very integral part of what you want to be towards March and April in this season. So mm -hmm. uh, it's good to ha get him these reps at this juncture. And you just hope when everybody's healthy, he can continue to be playing on a level like this because you throw him in the mix with OG, Pascal, Fred, you've got four guys who can give you 25, 30 any given night. So that's a great, great advantage to have when four of those guys are on the floor. And Jonesy, real quick, Banton had 31 in a G League game last night, and you can really see the influence of that experience in his play yeah. tonight. You're, you're so right, Randall. He made a couple of corner threes. He just looked more aggressive, more confident out there. And look, to, to, to the point that, that Sherman Jack made, guys move up a notch. Yeah. You think about it. When Fred's not on the floor, the two main ball handlers are Pascal and Scotty. Well, now you don't have Fred. You don't have Scotty. We talked about Malachi probably knowing that, you know, he might get an opportunity. And I'm sure Delano Banton, the same thing. He admitted to us in the radio interview uh, right after the game that, you know, there were times when uh, the league kind of got me. I wasn't quite as ready as I should have been. And with Nick Nurse, you need to be ready because you never know when your number is going to be called. He's got the reps with the 905. And, and Nick went to him early tonight. And again, he's a guy who can be a primary ball handler and decision maker. And I thought he was really, really good tonight. He was very confident and, and, and really gave a lot at both ends of the floor. Um, okay, let's do a little overtime real quick because uh, producer Christian Urban wants to talk about this. And <laughs> um, Oh, yeah, blame NBA's him, huh? Yeah, him. I do too. I want to know. I got you guys here, so I want to know about this as well. The NBA suspended Grayson Allen for one game with uh, without pay after he committed that flagrant foul that fractured the wrist of Alex Caruso. Um, Jack, just your thoughts on that suspension ruling. Well, you know, I'm a big believer. I've said this many times before. You know, if a guy's going to be out six to eight weeks, uh, why are we only suspending a guy one game? Uh, I think the impact it has on the standings for Chicago and the impact it potentially in a positive way could have for Milwaukee leapfrogging them. Uh, that has to be considered as well. And I, I think that uh, Billy Donovan had every right as did Alex Caruso uh, to question uh, the, the motive and, and the action and then even uh, the decision by the NBA. So uh, Grayson Allen uh, from his time at Duke, uh, but we don't base his time at Duke, but I could even base it on what he's done as a professional player in Utah and Memphis. Uh, this is not his first time uh, down this path. And to me, uh, I think uh, there should have been a greater penalty than what we saw. Mm -hmm. Sherm, how many games would you have suspended him for? And I got my, I cut my hair. So don't say anything just so you don't dis no, uh, I mistake me for grace. <laughs> I got it. I got it. Cause you look like, you not only look like him, you look like the type of person to do what he did too. Okay. All right. <laughs> I, I will say this though. I'm with Jack on this. If, if, you know, Alex Caruso is going to be out for six to eight weeks, then Grace and Allen should be sidelined for the same amount of time. I, I think it's just difficult to sit there and say, after the fact that one game is worth what he did. And, and I, I struggle because, to Jack's point, Chicago, they need Alex Caruso. He's a big part of why, why they brought him in and the success they're having. Mm -hmm. How do you quantify that with a one-game suspension? So, hey, if, if Alex Caruso is out for six to eight weeks, guess what, Grayson? You're going to sit down for a bit. And you're going to watch this happen and watch it all play out. But I just don't understand how one game is sufficient for that type of play and that type of injury. Yeah. But look, the, the Players Association probably gets involved around the limitations of the suspension. But I'll say something. In terms of, and, and I'll put my principal hat here on here. In terms of progressive discipline, as Jack said, this is not the first rodeo. This is not the first birthday party where Grayson Allen stuck his finger in the cake at the wrong time. I'm sorry. Progressive discipline 
and the reputation precedes you. Uh, hey, I go out in the schoolyard and there's a fracas and I walk over there and it's the same kid. It's like, yo, get into the office. And if you had a one day suspension last time, you're getting three this time. Like you have to put a deterrent out there. Mm -hmm. It may not change them at all, but it hits them in the pocketbook. It hurts the team. To me, that's minimum three to five games. Mm -hmm. If LeBron got, and, and we know what kind of player LeBron is. He's never been any, any, in any of that kind of stuff where he's been the aggressor or people have questioned uh, you know, his, his, his motives and, and, and was he the instigator. LeBron got a game with Isaiah Stewart, right? You're telling me, Grace Allen, that, that's the same as one game for Grace Allen that's been doing this before? Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't think so. Yeah, and, and I, I, just, I just want to make one quick point. You know, you talk about the players' union. And to me, even if you say, well, the players' union is going to balk at something beyond one game or three games, okay, fine. We're going to spend you for 10 games, but we'll pay you for the last seven, but you're not playing. And we're still going to right. penalize the Milwaukee Bucks yeah. because we're not going to allow them to gain a competitive advantage over the Chicago Bulls based upon this. So, yeah, you're going to be stuck paying this guy, but he's not going to be able to play. And even though it's a lesson, you know, and I'm sure there's the politics of the players union and the league. Nonetheless, I don't think the Milwaukee Bucks as an organization should benefit. And I know you guys said this. I think in my eyes, I'm looking at it saying, you know, why shouldn't Chris Middleton take somebody out uh, on another team? Why shouldn't Giannis take somebody out on another team? Suddenly they'll be the number one seed if the way things are going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and of course, Milwaukee puts out a statement disagreeing with the suspension entirely, which is like, I know you have to stand up for your player, but like, it's sort of ridiculous that you can even in good conscience say that that didn't deserve any sort of retro or uh, you know result uh, yeah. or a suspension agreed. i don't know agreed anyway thanks guys i appreciate you doing the show as always next game for the raptors thanks, Grace, tomorrow, night. <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow night you take that back man <laughs> tomorrow night in chicago against the bulls 8 p.m. Eastern. Sure, I'm on the court. Let's go anytime. <laughs> you might you might flagrantly foul me. I ain't coming on the court with you, Grayson. Come on, man. I'm all I'm not I'm clean. I'm clean. All right, fellas. See you guys next time.